1 Corinthians chapter 9. We hit a quick review before we stand up and do our reading, but uh, if you remember last week, we began to break this thing open about Paul and really how he dealt with criticism. Um, and I, I don't know that I did it very well justice-wise uh, when I preached last week, but I do hope that the takeaway we understand is criticism's in the world every day, right? Criticism's constantly going to happen. Uh, I was reading an article, I think it was in this, one of the newspapers that I get, I don't remember, but they were saying, oh no, it was a friend of mine that was preaching, and he says a lot of criticism comes from your own, like your close loved ones, it comes from your family, uh, it comes from your friends, you know, the why do you got to go to church, why do you got to read your Bible, why do you got to make these changes in your life, and I got to thinking about that really over the last few days uh, after reading and studying more, and I thought, boy, that's so true, a lot of our Close individuals are the ones that are really our biggest critics when you're trying to do things for God. It's just amazing to me. But anyway, Paul really taught a lesson there that when the criticism comes, and listen, we'd be a fool to think that it's not going to come if it came to Paul. I think I did pretty good on that uh, explanation that the people that he was with that, that he had saw saved, that seen the power of the apostleship on Paul were later deceived by false gospel and false prophets to come to the place that they're criticizing Paul and saying, you're not even an apostle, you're not even who you claim to be. Uh, and they were looking at the carnal things naturally to bring that. And if you remember what Paul's criticism was about, I truly believe it was the items or the materials that he was receiving uh, that they were calling him out for. And he says, hey, we're allowed to be partakers of the fruit. Paul never uh, took, that, took advantage of that. Uh, I was talking to the deaf folks earlier, and I said, you know, it's like when we send, we send support to missionaries, we don't think that $150 is just supposed to go to Bibles and good luck finding your food, good luck paying for your bills, good luck finding rent, right? I mean, those things go for the same thing, and that's the idea that Paul is trying to say is we can be partakers of the fruit. It's okay to do those things, but we don't take advantage of it. But Paul really laid down, I think, the, 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 the principle, if you will, the highway, the freeway of... When you're criticized and it will come, does your life line up with Scripture? In other words, let the Bible be your defense. As he said in verse 8, he says, does man say this or does the law of God say this? Um, so when we're dealing with criticism, which we will, we've got to live a life that's uh, Christ-honoring, of course, but we have to live a life that lines up with Bible. It has to line up with Bible uh, and he taught us that through that, that criticism can be, in fact, defended with the Word of God. All right, find 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to read verses 9 through 14. If you found your place, please stand with me. And we're going to try to get through these next few verses in these next few minutes. Remember with the idea, again, that these critics are against Paul. Verse 9, he says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Lord, we thank you for the precious word of God. We ask for your wisdom and your guidance here tonight, your discernment, Lord, not man's. I love you, I thank you, and I praise you. I need you, Holy Spirit to lead us tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Appreciate you standing and be seated. I want you to look at verse 8 real quick, because it says, Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also. So when Paul was, if you will, defending, or when Paul was rebuting, uh, rebutting the criticism of the questioning of these individuals that came to him, he mentions there about, well, you know, if I go to war, am I supposed to pay for it? If I plant a vineyard, am I not allowed to take fruit from it? And then he says, do I say these things or do the law say it? Now, what's interesting I love about Paul that we need to take heed to and learn about is that Paul comes back in an area that they would understand, right? There are some Jewish folks there that he's naturally dealing with. 
So he tells them of the Old Testament law, which is what verse 9 says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. And then he says, Doth God take care for the oxen? So Paul comes back to the Jewish crowd, if you will, and says, Did not the law of Moses say this? You remember Jesus even, he would combat the Pharisees many times and say, Have you not read when he was talking to the Pharisees? Did you not know? Well, I mean, he's, I think there's a little bit of sarcasm uh, included in that, but he's coming back with them about things that they ought to know or that they claim to know that truthfully go back to Scripture, okay? So he's going back to that. I always go back to the, the Bible is absolutely what we need. You remember when Christ was tempted in all three times of the temptation, how did he fulfill the defense of that with Scripture? He, he fulfilled that with the defense of Scripture. And now we come to the Apostle Paul, and he's really defending his apostleship, if you will. He doesn't get very deep into it, but he's defending his apostleship with Scripture. And he tells them, listen, you're accusing me of partaking of the fruit. You're accusing me of, I'm just going to use the example of monetary support that's coming to me, and I'm purchasing things, but I'm not doing it out of taking advantage of anybody. I'm doing it out of necessity to live on the focus of preaching the gospel. In other words, yeah, you sent $5 and it cost me $2.50 to eat for the month. I took the $2.50 and ate for the month. And then they're accusing him of this, uh, taking advantage of that monetary stuff or those uh, material things. And he comes back and says, listen, when the ox was treading the corn, he wasn't muzzled. Why wasn't he muzzled? So that he could eat the corn, partake of the fruit so that he could have the health to continue to mash it out. And that came from the law of Moses from God that that's acceptable. In other words, what he was saying is the same thing we said that was in Timothy, that it's okay the laborer will receive a reward. It's okay to partake of those fruits. Let me, let me ask you something. The moment we're saved, there's a whole gamut of things that we receive in salvation, right? Everybody with me? When we're saved, what do we receive? Help me out. The moment you're saved, the moment you put a faith and trust in Jesus Christ, what are some things that you get? <laughs> Eternal life. The Holy Spirit. Blessings as a child of God. Adoption. Okay, so we, we, the boldness to proclaim that, right? What's that? Justification. We receive a gamut of things. I'm talking a long list of things. When we're saved, right? Let's just focus on one, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the agent that convicts me, that draws me, right? I hear the Word of God. The Holy Spirit convicts me and draws me to give me that understanding of salvation, right? I mean, it's still my decision whether I want to believe. I know there's the people out there that believe you cannot reject that. But the Holy Spirit draws me to that place, and I put a faith and trust by Jesus Christ. Now, when I'm saved, that same Holy Spirit that drew me now seals me, right? That's one of the things the Holy Spirit does. But what else does the Holy Spirit do for me every day? Leads me, guides me, teaches me, provides me comfort, right? Is that not partaking of the fruit of the Holy Spirit that God gives me? Yes. God didn't just give it to me at the moment of salvation and say, you're done with it. I'm to partake of that fruit every day, and I'm not taking advantage of that. Let me give you another example. You talk about the grace of God. What is the grace of God? Help me out. What's the grace of God? Okay. So he gives us undeserving favor. We deserve hell because of our life and all of those things. And he says, no, uh, here's your undeserving favor. I will provide for you heaven. What's another aspect of grace after salvation? Let me, let me talk. Go ahead. Forgiveness. Forgiveness, right? Now, would this be taking advantage of grace? Now, grace is given to me for eternity, right? That grace doesn't disappear. So God doesn't just give me grace for salvation and then take that grace away. Because if he took it away, I'd be doomed the next day, probably the next hour, right? Because I would mess something up. So the grace of forgiveness that God gives me. Now, there's a difference. I want to partake in that grace. I'm learning, I'm growing, but I'm a human, and I make mistakes, and I get distracted, and I mess things up, right? That would not be taking advantage of the grace that God provides me. However, 
I know that I'm eternally saved. I know that I have assurance of salvation. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go live the life that Dean Francini wants to live. That grace is still there, but I'm not partaking of the fruit of grace in the right manner. I'm taking advantage of the grace of God. I'll just put it right down, right on our toes. Let's step on our toes a little bit, right? The grace of God saved me. That same grace that saved me, I ought to be sharing that grace. And if I don't share that gospel grace, then I believe that I'm taking advantage of the grace of God. Thank you for saving me. Like as some Baptists say, the, the, what is it, my four and no more. And thank you, God, for saving me and my family. But that's it. We're done, right? That's taking advantage of the grace of God. But I don't know how we got down that road. Understand the Holy Spirit that God gives us. I am to, I'm, it's okay for me to partake in that fruit every day. It's okay to do those things. And Paul is telling this group of people that have been saved through his preaching, listen, it's okay that people are supporting me. I'm not taking advantage of it. Why am I not taking advantage of it? Because they're supporting me to live. I need to eat, take clothes, have rent, so that I can therefore what? Go forth and still preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, listen, guys, you can accuse me all you want, but it lines up with Scripture. It lines up with Scripture. That's the best way to defend criticism is does your life line up with Scripture, okay? So it is in Scripture that the, mo the ox does it and God takes care of the ox and certainly he's going to take care of mankind as well. Now look what he says in verse 10. He says, now does, does God take care for the oxen? And he just mentioned, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth for it is written in the law of Moses. And he says, or saith he it all together for our sakes? He asks a question. Is he saying this for our sake, for our purpose? And look what verse 10, he says, for our sakes, no doubt. For our sakes, no doubt. In other words, let me, let me say it this way. The word of God is, is written for our benefit. The word of God is written for, for our purpose in life. The word of God is written in a manner that we can partake of the fruit of the word of God. Let me give you a simple application, right? The Bible says, don't do this, right? The light of the word says, go this way, don't do that. And I shut that light off and I go down this way. Then what am I going to reap? Carnal things, carnality, which are not spiritual, which Paul's going to talk about in just a moment. And I trip and I fall on my face and I'm all messed up in sin. Then I got to get all cleaned up because I look at the word of God and it is written for my sake. Oh, bless God, I can confess, 1 John 1, 9. And I can repent of this sin and I can turn back to God. Now God will forgive me, might be some scars still in my life, but God's going to forgive me. He cleans me all up, he dusts me back off and he puts me back on the road of doing and fulfilling what God would have me to do. So is this thing written for our sakes? Absolutely. Why do you think it's under such great attack? I guarantee if you ask on Sunday morning, if you ask our Sunday morning crowd, how many of you study and read the Word of God? I bet you'd be surprised at the answer that you would receive if you followed it up with every day. It's for our sakes. It's written for our purpose. It's, it pertains to all life and godliness. This will help me to walk the walk that I need to walk for God and walk the walk that I need to receive the rewards or the crowns we've been talking about in Sunday school. So it no doubt is written for our sake. God wrote this and recorded it so that we can understand and partake of the fruit of the things of God. And we are to be able to partake in those fruits daily because of the hope that we gain at salvation, the power that we gain at salvation. And how do we know all that? Because it's recorded down and written down for us to understand and to know. So he says, sure, it's for our sake. Absolutely. He says, for our sakes, no doubt this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope. Why do you tell people about Jesus? Because you hope they get saved, right? Why do you, uh, we talked about the crowns. Why do you want the crown of righteousness? I'm sorry. Why, why do you want to go through trials and tribulations in a manner that brings honor and glory unto God? Why, why do you want to go through those things in your life so that you can be drawn closer to God? Right? Got a little distracted. He that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. So we're doing the things that we do because it's written for our sake, and we understand the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. So that's why we go forth and plant. That's why we go forth and water. That's why we go forth and serve, because we do understand that God is going to provide those things for us. And look what he says in verse 11, which is contrary to the hope of God. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing that we shall reap your carnal things? I think it's just two-part. I think part of this Paul is saying, all I'm concerned with, I'm going to paraphrase here, Paul is saying all that I'm concerned with is the fact that you all are born again and that you all are serving God 
and reaping, I'm sorry, and sowing the, the fruitful things of God. So why is it a big deal uh, that you're accusing me of these carnal things? Let me back up. Is money carnal? Yeah, it's a worldly thing, right? It's, it's, it's a material thing that we need in this earth. Are clothes carnal? Yes, clothes are carnal. Everybody with me? You tracking? Everybody stay with me now. So there are things that we need in this life that are carnal. Let me say it this way. Is my food going to be eternal? No. Is my money going to be eternal? No. But I need those carnal things to survive today, right? No, you can't live without money. If you can figure it out, let me know. You can't live without food either, right? You, you can't live without water. Th those are carnal things. And I think there's a little bit of a comparison of where Paul is saying, listen, is it a great big deal that I've reaped and reaped and reaped spiritual uh, uh, I'm sorry, sowed and sowed spiritually among you, that I'm reaping a little bit of carnal things. Is that really such a big deal to you? Because I'm not taking advantage of those, I think is one aspect of what he's saying. But the second thing that I think that he's saying that we all need to understand there, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, in other words, we're sowing spiritual, is it a great thing that we shall reap carnal? Now there's a big deal about carnality, right? Go to Romans with me. There's a big deal about carnality. Now, now I'm not talking about the carnal things that we need, which is money, because remember what he says, the root of all evil, the love of money is the root of all evil. So when that carnal thing that I need in my life becomes the priority in my life, now I'm diminishing or I'm squelching off or I'm hurting the spiritual blessings that I can receive. My hope is now in carnality and my hope is no longer in spirituality, okay? But there's a problem with carnality. There's a problem with worldliness. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't... I know there were carnal things that the Old Testament, I'm sorry, that uh, the days of Paul that they had to contend with. Well, I'm all over the place tonight. Listen, I was, I was thinking about entertainment. You know, I'm going to make everybody mad tonight. I was thinking about entertainment. And I thought about all the entertaining things that we have in America. Then I started thinking about the entertaining things that third world countries have in comparison to what we have. It's, it's a great bit less. So then I started thinking about Paul's days, and <laughs> sometimes you just study and read things that probably don't mount to a hill of beans, but so I'm looking at, and you, you know what their entertainment, there was the Coliseum fights, uh, kind of the Olympic, the Olympic games, stuff like that was, was mainly the entertainment that they had in those days. That was it. That was it. And I thought for just a moment, Paul <laughs> is writing about the carnal things that these people are dealing with. And I don't know, for the sake of arguing, there are three things that they could choose from. They could either go to the Coliseum and watch a gladiator fight, they could go down the road and watch a race, or they go to the other place and watch a chariot race, horse race. There are three things they have to deal with, right? And then you move that to a third world thing, and you look at third world countries. I'm going to make a point here in a minute. You look at third world countries, they don't have the money and the, and the entertainment, they don't have the electric, they don't have the things to watch everything that we watch, they don't have the money to participate in those things, they don't have all the sports and all that other stuff that's going on. And then you compare that to America. And I thought about this verse. Now I'm talking about sinners. I'm talking about Christians. Where are Christians vested today? It's a whole lot more in carnality than it is in spiritual things. Now, I'm just trying to make a comparison because Paul was talking to them when there's, I'm sure there were more than three choices, but let's just say this. They probably had 10% of what we deal with today. And, and Paul is struggling with these people and the carnal things that they're dealing with. And I know there were deeper things. There was idolatry and, and fornication and the, and the strife of being in the clique and all those things. But it was a whole lot less of what we have Today And Paul's warning them way back there, hey, you guys keep your eye, you stay in the fight of spiritual things. You stay in the fight for spiritual things. You can't get distracted by the carnal things that this world has to offer. Nothing to do with the message tonight, but I don't know about you, I, I, I do love America. I know, I mean, I, I want to be more focused on the gospel than anything. And I gave, you know, 20 years to serve, you know, boo-hoo, who cares? But what bothers me is how much God blessed this nation with and how God used this nation to reach many people with the gospel of Christ. And just in a couple hundred years, we flipped it. We have flipped it. We really have. Evil will always be evil. As a matter of fact, it's going to get worse, right? Evil men will wax worse and worse. We understand that in perilous times. <laughs> we'll be what we are today. If you read Timothy, that list right there, right? 
But what bothers me is we who have experienced the grace of God, the love of God, we have partaken of the fruit of grace, the Holy Spirit of God that's within us. And we hang out over here in this carnal realm, and it's all about me, me, me. And we wonder why we're in the place that we're at. Paul was warning of that. He was warning of that. In Romans chapter 8, verse 4, it says that the righteousness of the law might be, no, let's pick up in verse, I'm sorry, verse 5. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. He says, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. And that's true, right? I'm, Christianity as a whole, and when you, when you try to look at things, Christianity, they call it Protestants, and we're under Protestants, right? We know we're not, but we fall under that realm. When you look at Christianity as a whole, how do they worship now? It's for the flesh. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. And let me add this. If Christianity is supposed to be growing the way that it is in the praise and worship scene and entertaining the flesh and the itchy ears, then how come that cause and effect hasn't done anything for the gospel of Jesus Christ? What it has caused is more of an effect for me to chase the fleshly things that this world has to offer, more carnality. I mean, I'm not no expert at it, but you can see that. For they that are the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Makes sense. For to be carnally minded is death, the Bible says, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Isn't that amazing? But now here's the scary part. Look at verse 7. Now this is why, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Look, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. In Isaiah, or in Proverbs, Psalm, somewhere in there, it says, because I've regarded iniquity in my heart, God had hit, has hid his face from me. Okay? In other words, God's turned his face from me because I'm regarding iniquity. You might say, well, it's iniquity. I know for sure that I should not be doing that, and I'm ignoring it, and I'm still doing that. That would be iniquity. Okay? So I'm regarding iniquity in my heart, and God is hiding his face from me. So I want you to understand what that means for a moment. I'm praying that so-and-so gets saved, but I'm regarding iniquity in my heart. My prayer of faith is going about as high as this ceiling because I'm regarding iniquity in my heart. And until I relieve that iniquity in my heart, then I cannot reap those spiritual things, okay? So when I'm dabbling in, in carnality, which is enmity with God, I get to the place that I'm no longer subject to the Word of God. Let's be honest, I don't care about the things of God because I care about the carnal things that are much more. Now that's the accusation that they were making against Paul. Ultimately, what they were saying is, Paul, you're so concerned about these carnal things that we don't even believe you're an apostle anymore and that you're taking advantage of all of these carnal things. Ultimately, what they're saying to Paul is that you're no longer a spiritual individual. So I can understand why Paul writes this thing back to them and says, listen, time on a court. Time on the court. Carnality is a dangerous thing. And carnality affects every individual, unfortunately. And ultimately, when we get in the flesh, we are not going to be subject to the law of God. Now, remember, the Word of God is a spiritual book, and we need to be spiritual, right? I mean, it tells us to worship Him in spirit and truth, right? This is a spiritual book, and we need to be full of the Holy Spirit, if you will, yielded to the Holy Spirit as we look into the Word of God to make application of things of the Word of God. I'm not saying... I understand the issues of life. Probably going to eat these words one day, but sometimes I wish I was born out in the middle of a jungle and didn't have to deal with the stuff that this world imposes upon us. He says, if we have not sown a new spirit, or if we have sown a new spiritual things, is it not a great thing that we should reap your carnal things? He goes on in verse 12. If you go back to Corinthians with me. He goes on to verse 12. After he asked, I don't understand why we're dealing with all and reaping all these carnal things. I mean, some of that was his accusation. That was, some of that was his criticism. Some of that was the division. Some of that was just a lack of the knowledge of the things that he taught him. Anyway, he comes back in verse 12 and he says, And if others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? You know what Paul's saying there? He's saying, listen, if you guys are submitted to the authority of these false teachers and the false prophets... And the falseness of the doctrine that's been brought in, if, in other words, if you've yielded 
to the subject of their power are not we rather. In other words, let me say it this way. Paul would be saying, listen, you guys came to the gospel because we came and preached it. Now, Paul wouldn't say it this way, but we were there. You saw the power of God within us. We preached the message that Christ must have suffered and died and risen again on the third day. And you recognize your freedom from your bondage of sin, and you put a faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So he says, rather not, shouldn't you be subject to the authority of what we preach to you, other than being under the subject and the authority of all this false junk that has come to you? That's what Paul asked him. It's a good question to ask. Nevertheless, and he goes on, I love this. Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. You know what Paul's saying? Paul's saying, I have all, and he does. Paul had all of the authority of an apostle upon him. He blinded a man. You remember that? He, he, go be blind. That'd be a neat power to have, right? He blinded a man. I mean, he performed miracles. He had the power of God upon him. All of his time. And he never abused that power to hinder the gospel. Now, he could, have, he could have hindered the gospel by abusing that power. Does that make sense? You with me? He could have abused his power in the gospel. Just like the example I gave. I believe when we hide the gospel and we live a life of sin, we abuse the power that God has given us. Let me explain. I can, I'm, I'm forever going to heaven. But Christ didn't save me to take me straight to heaven, right? Christ saved us for a purpose, right? What's the purpose? To shine a light into a dark world. That's, that's what he tells us. But not only does he give us that purpose to shine a light in a dark world, he gives us the power, the partaker of that spirit, the Holy Spirit, to be able to do that, to be able to preach that, okay? So Paul says there, we basically, we never abused our power. Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Wouldn't it be great if we all would live a life of that same goal in our mind? We don't want to do anything to hinder the gospel. Pause for effect. That means I have to watch what I say. That means I have to watch how I respond. Right? Right? That means I have to watch the things that I do. I have to avoid some places that I used to go. Stop acting like I used to act, right? Because that hinders the gospel. Why do you think all of these people have this big mindset of, uh, they got an abbreviation for it, but once saved, always saved. They say that you take advantage, you have a license to sin. Why are they saying that? Because there are people that were saved, probably truly born again, that took advantage of that grace, and because of their lifestyle, they have, in fact, hindered the gospel. Because people say, you're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. You don't live what you believe. You don't act the way you ought to act as a Christian, according to the Word of God. And they hinder the gospel. Now, we know the power of the gospel is what saves, right? We, we understand that. And we understand that carnality is not going to promote our spirituality. It's, in fact, enmity with that. It's opposite of that. So what we need is His power upon us through the Holy Spirit of God to carry what? The power of the gospel message to a lost and dying world. That's what we need. That's what we ought to be partaking in. That's exactly what Paul did to those people at the town of Corinth. Verse 13. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they that wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Now, how did the Levites get fed back in the day? Anybody? How did the Levites, the priests, all those people in the Old Testament, how did they get paid? How did they eat? In the wilderness, yep. But I'm saying when they were working, right? The offerings. Sometimes the offering would say burn the innards, right? Burn the call, burn the liver. But the rest was for what? For them, right? Sometimes some of the meat would be burnt, some of the meat would be given to them. You remember the Levites, they said you would, uh, or when you read Malachi, it says you bring the first fruits to the storehouse, right? And they were to partake of that. That's what Paul is addressing here. Paul is saying, listen, number one, God provides it. But there in the ministry of serving, they were bringing it to the temple. They were bringing it to the altar. And they, therefore, could take, partake in that same food, fruit, to pay for their living, if you will. Okay? 
So do you not know they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? So that's one aspect of it, is that the things would be provided through the people of God. But the second thing of that is, because you remember in the Old Testament when they messed that thing up, God killed them, right? I think it was Eli's kids uh, and a couple other the kids that they got killed because they were living outside of that. Now Paul just said, Paul just said in verse 12, I don't want anything to hinder the gospel. And then he comes back in verse 13, which I think is, is two-part. Number one, they would live the life they need from the part, for partaking of the fruit. But number two, that those that were working in the temple needed to be temple workers, if you will. Those that were partaking at the altar needed to be altar people, if you will. Verse 14, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live with the gospel. I think what Paul is addressing here is hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. We ought to live our lives in a manner that we do nothing to hinder the gospel. And if we're preachers of the gospel, I recognize some of that's himself uh, and Sylvanius and, 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 and Timothy preaching to them. I understand some of that. But also every one of us is a proclaimer of the gospel. And he says we ought to live of it. Now, number one, you can't be a preacher of the gospel if you haven't partaken of the gospel, right? So the gospel's preached, death, burial, and resurrection so that individuals can be saved. When we're saved, we're partakers of that gospel message, okay? We're, we're partakers of that fruit of salvation. But now, he says, I'm to live of the gospel. Now, what's the gospel, church? What's the gospel? Death, burial, and resurrection, right? So how do I live of the gospel? Well, I'm to be dead. To self, right? I'm to be dead to self. It should be buried. The old man should be buried. We talked about 2 Corinthians 5, 17 last week. I'm a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things are new, right? So that means, as they said, take up your cross daily and follow me. As Paul said, die daily. If I'm to live of the gospel, then I need to be dead of self. Or as Galatians 2.20 said, right? Nevertheless, I don't live, but Christ that liveth in me. That's what Paul's saying. You can't be a hypocrite in this thing, and you can't be an abuser of this power, and you can't be a user of this power. Tracking? So ultimately, the written word is absolutely for our sakes. We recognize that. So we'd better take advantage of it, if you will. We don't only partake, and we certainly shouldn't be greedy, but we sure, sure, surely shouldn't be hypocritical. The word is for us, live, serve with hope in Christ. Spiritual reaping all, is always better than physical and carnal, I promise you that. Submit to the authority that's over you in Christ Jesus, and don't be a hypocrite and live for him. Now, all of this started because they were accusing Paul. And Paul says, first off, the scripture says that I'm allowed to be a partaker of that. Second off, there's a deeper meaning in there where Paul says, listen, you guys are supposed to be. What does it say in John 15 that, uh, that you, should, you should bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, right? Because sometimes that's going to be a benefit, if you will, for later on down the road. I use the example, somebody gets saved, uh, and through that ministry later on, they, they, supply, they, they support that same individual that led them to the Lord that's a missionary down the road. He's now partaking of that spiritual fruit that he had reaped. Let me just make an easier one, right? As I'm reading through the scripture and I find something that gives me victory in my life over something sinful, I'm now a partaker of that fruit. And I'm to continue to live within that fruit, okay? So I'm, I'm learning and growing and learning and growing. And Paul says, ultimately, let your life mirror the word of God, match the word of God, so that the word of God can be the defense against those that come against me. Because it's going to happen. The very people that he invested in doubted his apostleship. The very people that he invested in and seen saved were later accusing him and trying to take him down and hinder the gospel of his preaching. Those same people that he invested in. And Paul doesn't get revenge. Paul doesn't get evil. Paul just says, what's the word of God say? What's the Bible say? And for that to be that impressive or that much of an impact then I have to be a partaker of the gospel, as in living the gospel. If I'm a hypocrite, then their accusations could hold some ground. If I'm not a hypocrite, then I can defend with the word of God in a way that it might impact them and change their lives to turn them around, just as Paul is trying to do with them. Our way of living is a big deal. It's a very big deal, and it lines up with this. Let's not be a hypocrite. 
the Word of God is for our sake and for our purpose. Let's live it. Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for which uh, few things we went through here tonight, Lord. I pray that they just stick in our hearts and our minds, God. I pray this, Lord, honestly, that we would recognize that the carnal things of this world are, uh, number one, they're admittedly, and I get to the place where I'm not subject to the Word of God. But, Lord, the carnal things, although they're enticing and although they're fun for a season, Lord, they will hurt us, they will destroy us, and they will hinder the gospel of Jesus Christ going out into a lost and dying world, Father. And I'll be tied to that, Lord, as an individual that's supposed to be a proclaimer of that. Father, help us to not be hypocritical, Lord, at all. Help us to not take advantage of the things that you've given to us, Lord. Help us to take that and to sow it out, God, that we would reap spiritual things over carnal things. And Lord, I pray this, when the accusations and the criticism and the calling out do come, Father, that we would be, I guess I could say spiritual enough, Lord, is just to trust you and to depend upon you and say, you know what? Listen, folks, my life lines up with Scripture. It lines up with Scripture. It lines up with Scripture. But for that to happen, it's going to have to be a daily thing for us to die to ourself, Lord, and to live for you. Please keep us safe as we head out. Father, bring us back safely on Sunday. Thank you so much for your protection and getting us all here, Lord. And I pray that you'd bless us as we leave out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. Make sure you smile at one another. Be happy, be friendly, and we'll see you on Sunday, Lord willing.